Good afternoon. I'm Rick Caulfield, Chancellor here at the University of Alaska Southeast. So welcome back uh, for the second part of our Power and Privilege Symposium. Uh, I wanted to use this opportunity to again express our appreciation to the Ak Kwan. We had elders with us here this morning who shared their knowledge and wisdom about this place, beautiful place that we're lucky enough to, to have as the home for our university. And so, Gunas uh, Chish to the Ak Kwan. And I've also been asked uh, about the history of this Power and Privilege Symposium. And I thought I would just share a very few uh, comments about that. It was students from our university here now, I think five years ago, who visited um, a college in the Pacific Northwest. And uh, they went down specifically to join in a power and privilege symposium that was held. Uh, it was at Whitman College. And they came back to Juno and said, we should be doing a power and privilege symposium here at the University of Alaska Southeast. And I think everyone who heard the idea said, that's brilliant. Let's do it. And so four years ago, we began the first of these annual events. We have now built this into our calendar. So it's an integral part of um, University of Alaska Southeast education. And I'm pleased too that we're streaming it so it's available to a even wider audience. And I've always appreciated the fact that it was students who generated the idea for starting this at the University of Alaska Southeast. And I'm pleased today to see the number of students who are here in the room with us, students who are volunteering uh, to organize the event and to be um, the leaders of this activity. So uh, thank you to the students who are here and those who have been involved with the planning. And specifically, I wanted to take a moment to, to thank the planning committee. Uh, and that includes uh, Brandy Mulberry, who is the student government president, Juliet Aldridge, who um, I saw wandering around this morning with her little nine-month-old baby in arms. And I thought, boy, these students are getting younger by the day. Um, Christian English, CJ Harrell, Tina Ryman, who's going to be introducing our keynote speaker here in just a moment, L. Rukti, Forrest Wagner, who you heard from this morning, Colleen James, Laura Vess, Lily Bannerman, Margie Thompson, Nathan Bodenstadt, Peter Summers, Tatiana Topping, Robin Gilchrist, Richard Simpson, Robin Walls, and Sean McCarthy. So let's give them a big round of applause. Thank you all for the amazing work you've done to bring us all together today. And I am going to let uh, Tina Ryman introduce our keynote speaker, but uh, I have to say, just as a little personal note, uh, Heather Kendall Miller is someone I've had the privilege of knowing going back, I think we said almost 30 years. Uh, back in the mid-90s, Heather was working as an attorney with the Native American Rights Fund, as you'll hear, and she was involved with an important case called the State of Alaska versus the Native Village of Vinitai Tribal Government, a community in the interior of Alaska located up near the Brooks Range. And prior to that, I had been working with the Alaska Department of Fish and Game Division of Subsistence. And I had the privilege of working with elders in the communities of Arctic Village and Vinitai, communities of about 200 people each, two to 300 people, and to document the Gwich'in Athabascan place names of those communities. And there were hundreds and hundreds of names that the elders knew. Um, lakes and rivers and mountaintops and places, sheep licks, uh, salt licks for where the, the doll sheep would, could be found and places where moose yarded up and passes where the caribou went through and they could be counted on, you could count on finding caribou in those places. And so I was privileged to work with those elders and to document that there were hundreds and hundreds of names. And as it turned out, unbeknownst to me, a few years later, I was asked to be a witness in this case uh, the native village of Vinitai case, because part of the, um, the criteria for uh, establishing uh, the, the, the important reach of the tribal government there was to be able to show traditional land use and occupancy of that place. And little did I know when I was sitting with those elders some years before, usually these were communities that at that time had no electricity, so under a, 
hissing Coleman lantern and looking over these maps with elders, they knew exactly where these places were and we wrote them down. Uh, I didn't, but assistance from the community wrote them down. And so th these maps became part of the evidence for uh, documenting clearly that the native village of Initai was a bona fide indigenous tribe and knew well its, its land. And so it was a privilege for me at that time to work with Heather and her husband Lloyd on that important case. So it's a, it's a real pleasure just to have the opportunity to visit with Heather again today. And with that, I'm gonna turn this over to Tina Ryman who is gonna offer a formal um, welcome and introduction for Heather Kendall Miller. Thank you. Goodness, geez. Welcome everyone to this afternoon's keynote presentation. It is my very great honor to introduce our guest speaker. Um, Heather Kendall Miller's life story is as inspirational as her career is impressive. She holds the distinction of being the first Alaska native to graduate from Harvard Law School and to try a case before the US Supreme Court of the United States. She has been an advocate, a warrior, and a resource to the Alaska Native people, and she is an inspiration to us all. <clears throat> On another note, um, Heather has graciously and generously offered to uh, donate her speaker fees today to the UAS Scholarship Fund. Heather. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming here to our campus to speak today. Everyone, please join me in welcoming Heather Kendall, Willi Heather Kendall Miller. Uh, it's an honor to be invited to be here to speak with you today. Um, I, it thrills me to think that uh, your student body is engaged in these kinds of discussions and that it's important to you to talk about power and privilege. Um, this is absolutely essential to not only our democracy, um, but uh, who we are uh, and where we fit in uh, to humanity. So good cheese for inviting me. And she's Rick for reminding me how old we are. <laughs> we go way back. Good cheese to the Akwan Clinket for sharing their lands with us. Uh, and again, uh, good cheese for inviting me to share a bit of my story with you today in the context of power and privilege. Now I've been invited to speak for 50 minutes. That's a long time. Um, and I know you just ate lunch, so it's not gonna break my heart if you start to snooze. Um, I can go on, and I will. Um, uh, yeah, the invitation has, has, has made me have to kind of think a little bit. Um, and so I, I developed some things that I'm um, looking forward to being able to share. Um, in our traditional way, we, we in, use our introductions to talk about uh, who we are in terms of our family line. So I'm gonna spend a little bit of time doing that first before I get into a, a kind of a broader discussion. Uh, some of the things that uh, I picked up along the way through my education and, and thereafter. So um, I have to take off my glasses to see my writing and I won't be able to see your faces, but we'll go with that. My name, as you know, is Heather Kendall Miller. I'm Denina Athabaskan and an indigenous woman on my maternal side. My mother was Ruth Peterson, who was born in the village of Ikuk in the Bristol Bay region. Her mother, my grandmother, was Sasa Nielsen. As to Sasa's indigenous identity, it's a little unclear due to successive deaths on our maternal side. What we know is based on what my mother told my father before she passed away. 
And she told him that she was Indian as opposed to Eskimo. We recognize now that the words Indian and Eskimo are colonialist terms for assigning racial identity to the diversity of indigenous existence. In the 1950s, government agencies used both terms to classify Alaska Native people. My mother used the term Indian when speaking about her mother's people who were from upriver. When I was in my 20s and searching for my identity, I was curious how we could be Athabascan in an otherwise Yupik area. I looked at a map and saw what that in fact, the Denina Athabascan people occupied the Lake Clark and Iliamna region, and that it was possible to float down river to arrive at Bristol Bay. Sasa and her sisters made that journey. She came down river as a young girl after losing her parents and extended family to one of the many epidemics that ravaged native people in the wake of contact with European traders. After losing her parents, Sasa and her sisters ingathered in Bristol Bay in the village of Ecock, where the salmon fishery and cannery provided employment to many. There at the age of 17, she met and married a Swedish immigrant named Adolf Peterson, who was the cannery watchman. It must have seemed like a good match at the time, for as the story goes, Sasa and her sisters hoped that by marrying white men, life would get easier. But not so. My maternal grandfather was an alcoholic and a domestic abuser. Sasa and her mother, no, Sasa had my mother at the age of 18 and another daughter a few years thereafter. She didn't get a chance to raise her own children as she too passed away in her early 20s from the flu. After she passed, my grandfather remarried my mother and my mother was given away to be raised by others. This was probably a good thing as my mother's younger half siblings suffered terrible emotional scars from their father's alcohol raged, fuel, fueled rage. My mother was taken in by two old bachelors from Sweden who made jewelry. They treated her with kindness and carved her an ivory beaded necklace and gifted it to her when she was 12. When she grew older, she was taken in by the Bradford family who owned and ran the commercial store in Dillingham. They took her to Los Angeles in the winter where she was exposed to fashion and the arts. She aspired to be worldly and practiced self-improvement by teaching herself new words from the dictionary. Like her mother before her, she wanted to marry a non-native man so that her life would be easier. My mother met my father in Seward, Alaska in the early 1950s. They were both in their early 30s. My father, Jack Ferguson, is a non-native and came to Alaska seeking opportunity after World War II. He had been raised in Hokiam, Washington on the peninsula, Olympic Peninsula, and his parents on both sides could trace their European ancestry back several generations and were somewhat certain about their points of origin. Upon arriving in America, both sides of my father's family moved west, seeking opportunity, and thus participated in and benefited from the dispossession of indigenous peoples from their Aboriginal lands. Now, I doubt whether my grandparents or my great-grandparents on my father's side fully understood the gravity of this and how their opportunity came at the expense of others whose connection and use and occupation of lands extended for millennia far into the past. What I do know is that their experience including, included living in close proximity to indigenous peoples. My great-grandmother taught school on the Rosebud Sioux Reservation. My other great-grandparents had a horse ranch in Montana close to the Blackfeet 
preservation. And it is perhaps because of this that my father was raised without prejudice towards indigenous peoples. Such bias never crossed his mind when he encountered my mother's warm smile through a window in a sewer diner where she worked. He walked in and was smitten. My parents had three girls together before my mother passed away of spinal meningitis at the age of 32. I was two and a half at the time of her passing. My older sister was three and a half and my younger sister was three months. After somehow surviving a year on his own with three very young children, my father met a woman who was sent to Alaska to serve as a public health nurse in the wake of the tuberculosis epidemic. He met her when he brought us in for inoculations. She was in her early 40s and had defied expectations for women at the time by getting an education and living independently. But living independently had its limitations and she was ready to commit to conventional wisdom that women should be married. Knowing that her time for childbearing was at an end, she opted for raising someone else's children. My stepmother, however, was a product of her time. She was born in 1914, first generation Irish Catholic and raised in New York City at a time when new immigrants vied for power and status over other newly arrived immigrants. She was raised with the belief that white skinned Irish Catholics were superior to people of color. My stepmother never grew out of her learned prejudice and that posed a problem for her and us when she met and fell in love with my father. She wanted to be a mother, but did not want to raise native children. She reconciled this conflict by adopting us and reinventing our past, making us into a white passing family. In doing so, she intentionally denied us our native heritage and kept us from any connection to our native family and culture. My father acquiesced. Although my stepmother wanted to be identified as a mother, she was incapable of mothering because she could never fully bring herself to overcome her bias that whites were superior to natives. Miraculously, her abusive treatment of us as inferior people by virtue of our race did not instill in us the seed of self-loathing. Instead, it fed the fire and passion to know and understand our indigenous identity, to take back what she tried to take from us. For me, that took the form of study at the University of Alaska in the 1980s. I majored in history and minored in Alaska Native Studies, which means I took every class available in anthropology, linguistics, political science, and literature that had anything to do with Alaska Natives. This education, of course, was one taught in the Western model. I learned about Native history, language, social, and political organization from non-Native white instructors. And, of course, much of what I was taught was grounded in colonial concepts that colored generations of academic thought. I did not see this at the time. I was just so happy to be learning about nativeness that it didn't dawn on me much that much of what I was learning was based on false narratives. When I discovered federal Indian law in my senior year, I was thrilled with the prospect that there was a body of law that defined the rights of Native Americans. Over the years, though, I've come to see the area of federal Indian law as one fraught with inconsistencies, bias, and lacking incredible moral and legal foundation. Federal Indian law is, in Judge Canby's view, federal law about Indians. Judge Canby sits on the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals and has written a 
book entitled American Indian Law in a Nutshell. In his introduction to the field, he describes Indian law as follows, and I quote, the unique legal posture of the tribes in relation to the federal government is deeply rooted in American history. And a knowledge of, knowledge of historical context is perhaps more important to the understanding of Indian law than of any other legal subject. Indian law has always been heavily intertwined with federal Indian policy. And over the years, the law has shifted back and forth with the flow of popular and governmental attitudes towards Indians." End quote. And so from Judge Canby's perspective, the development of Indian law is an area best understood as a reflection of Indian policy, which in turn has varied based upon the historical era of a particular time. Charles Wilkinson, in his book, American Indians, Time and the Law, picks up in this theme as well, and he writes, quote, Indian policy has been cyclic. This is due in part to the sheer length of time during which it has been made. Even more fundamentally, federal Indian policy has always been the product of tension between two conflicting forces, assimilation and separatism. And Congress has never made a final choice as to which of the two it will pursue. Thus, the laws are not only numerous, they are also conflicting, born of the explicit regimen and implicit time of the eras in which they were enacted. As a consequence, Indian law, more than any body of law that regularly comes before the Supreme Court, is a time-warped field." End quote. So while we must understand Indian law in the context of history, we must keep in mind Howard Zinn's caution that history is a narrative told by the conquerors. It reflects the acts and deeds of the conquerors, not the conquered. And this is particularly true when we discuss the area of federal law about Indians. When I first entered the field, I believed that by utilizing the tool of a law degree, I could fight and advance Native American rights. I could use the existing Western paradigm of law and morality to shift the balance of power to restore rights taken from Native people. There was some promise in that aspiration. In the wake of the civil rights movement, lawyers and Native rights activists succeeded in winning a slew of cases during the Warren and Burger courts court eras, which gave optimism to the belief that the law could be used as a tool for social justice. With that goal in mind, I headed to Harvard Law School. Now, I think we can all agree that Harvard is an elitist institute that has served for generations as a pillar of patriarchal privilege and class status. By the time I arrived in the late 80s, things had changed moderately. Women had been part of the student body for 30 years, and people of color were likewise being admitted in number. But critical legal studies was still regarded as an outlier to the more traditional methods of teaching law. And law classes on topics like people as property or indigenous rights in the international arena were still not considered relevant subjects. Even though Harvard itself was built with wealth de derived from black slave labor on lands taken from indigenous peoples. In fact, Harvard Law School was established through a bequest from the estate of Isaac Royal, a wealthy Antiguan plantation owner and slaveholder who immigrated to Boston. Royal's coat of arms with its three stacked wheat sheaves was used as the school's crest from 1936 to 2016. As Noam Chomsky has pointed out, the two founding crimes of American society are slavery and the expulsion or extermination of the indigenous nations and destruction of their complex and rich civilizations. <laughs> 
in order for the young American democracy to find legitimacy, these two founding crimes had to find justification in the law. Annette Gordon-Reed has written that, and I quote, the documents most closely associated with the creation of the United States, the Declaration of Independence, and the Constitution present a problem with which Americans have been contending from the country's beginning. How to reconcile the values espoused in those texts with the United States' original sin of slavery, the flaw that marred the country's creation, warped its prospects, and eventually plunged it into civil war. The Declaration of Independence had a specific purpose, to cut the ties between the American colonies and Great Britain and establish a new country that would take its place among the nations of the world. But thanks to the vaulting language of its famous preamble, the document instantly came to mean more than that. Its confident statement that all men are created equal with unalienable rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, put notions of freedom and equality at the heart of the American experiment. Yet, it was written by a slave owner, Thomas Jefferson, and released into 13 colonies that all, to one degree or the other, perpetuated slavery. The Constitution, which united the colonies turned states, was no less tainted. It came into existence only after a heated argument over and fateful compromise on the institution of slavery. Members of the revolutionary generation often cast that institution as a necessary evil that would eventually die of its own accord, and they made their peace with it to hold together the new nation. The document they fought over and signed in 1787, revered almost as a sacred text by many Americans, directly protected slavery. It gave slave owners the right to capture fugitive slaves who crossed state lines, counted each enslaved person as three-fifths of a free person for the purpose of apportioning members of the House of Representatives, and prohibited the abolition of the slave trade before 1808. The Constitution's treatment of Native Americans is somewhat less specific and merely provides that, and I quote, Congress shall have the power to regulate commerce with foreign nations and among the several states and with the Indian tribes. That is found in Article 1, Section 8, Clause 3. But as things would have it, that clause, that by its terms, its terms was intended to authorize Congress to regulate commerce with Indian tribes, with time became the source of power over Indian tribes. The Indian Commerce Clause has resulted in what, what is known as Congress's plenary authority, plenary power over Indian affairs, which means that Congress has the ultimate right to pass legislation governing Native Americans, even when that legislation conflicts with or abrogates Indian treaties. The seeds of Congress's plenary authority over Indian affairs is rooted in the doctrine of discovery. The doctrine of discovery established a spiritual, political, and legal justification for colonization and seizure, seizure of land not inhabited by Christians. It has been invoked since Pope Alexander VI issued a papal bull in 1493. The papal decree aimed to justify Christian European explorers' claims on land and waterways they allegedly discovered and promote Christian domination and superiority. If a European explorer proclaims to have discovered land in the name of a Christian European monarch, plants a flag on its soil, and reports its discovery to the European rulers, and then returns to occupy it, the land is now his, even if someone else was there first. This ideology supported the dehumanization of those living on the land 
and their conquest, dispossession, genocide, and forced assimilation. The doctrine fueled white supremacy insofar as white European settlers claimed they were instruments of divine design and possessed cultural superiority. The doctrine of discovery found its way into federal common law in the early 1820s and is still today regarded as the origin of property law. The case Johnson v. McIntosh, decided in 1823, involved a dispute over the ownership of parcels of land in the Ohio River Valley. Both parties claimed they had acquired title from Indian nations in the area. The Supreme Court held that Indians could not sell their property interests to anyone except the national sovereign. Referring to the newly established federal courts as the courts of the conqueror, Chief Justice Marshall held that the doctrine of discovery gave the discovering European sovereign a title against all other European nations, and along with it, the sole right of acquiring the soil from the natives. The Indian retained a right of occupancy, which the discovering sovereign could extinguish, either by purchase or by conquest. And in so holding, the court confirmed national authority over Indian affairs. This was in fact the policy of the crown, which had barred all land and commercial transactions with Indians absent sovereign consent since at least the 1763 British Proclamation. The policy was adopted by the first Congress in the 1790 Trade and Intercourse Acts and incorporated into federal common law through Chief Justice Marshall's holding. The doctrine of discovery is still taught in law schools today and remains a foundation doctrine for federal supremacy over Indian affairs even though there is no mention of it in the Constitution. But there is more to Chief Justice Marshall's legacy in the area of federal law over Indians. In Cherokee Nation, the state of Georgia tried to assert the authority to legislate the Cherokee Nation's government out of existence and then to confiscate Indian lands and resources. Between 1828 and 1830, Georgia enacted a series of laws that divided up the Cherokee territory among several Georgia counties, extended state laws, and made criminal any attempts of the Cherokees to act as a government. To combat these actions of Georgia, the Cherokees brought an original action in the Supreme Court. But the ability of the tribe to bring such a suit depended upon being a foreign state within the meaning of Article Three of the Constitution, which defines federal judicial power. In his analysis, Chief Justice Marshall first determined that the Cherokee tribe had succeeded in demonstrating that it was a state, a distinct political society separated from others, capable of managing its own affairs and governing itself. And that trees between the tribe and the United States had so recognized it. But Marshall next determined that tribes could nonetheless not qualify as foreign states. And I quote, they may more correctly perhaps be denominated domestic dependent nations. They occupy a territory to which we assert a title independent of their will, which must take effect in, in point of possession when their right of possession ceases. Meanwhile, they are in a state of pupillage. Their relation to the United States resembles that of a ward to its guardian. And so, with a stroke of a pen, Marshall's reference to tribes as domestic dependent nations, provided a doctrinal basis for protection of tribes and their inherent sovereignty by the federal government, but it also provided opportunity for later courts to limit, to discover limits to tribal sovereignty by virtue 
of their domestic dependent status. His reference, moreover, to tribes as wards provided further support for those that disagreed with Marshall's view that the tribes were capable of self-government. In the second Cherokee case that followed a year later, a case known as Georgia v. Worcester, the court held that the state of Georgia had no ability to force its laws in Indian country, which were barred under the Supremacy Clause by federal statutes and the Cherokee Nation's treaties with the United States. Of course, the court's decision favoring the tribe did nothing to prevent the political and military process that eventually forced the Cherokee people to undergo the Trail of Tears. The Supreme Court's foundational cases allowed the federal political process and all of its attendant prejudices inconsistencies and complexities to dominate Indian affairs after the Marshall Trilogy for the last two centuries. But please do not let this abysmal history and critique of the Western legal system dissuade those of you who are thinking of going to law school from doing so. I do not regret doing so. I stand by my choice to use the law as a shield and as a sword. As mentioned earlier, law over Indian people reflects Indian policy. And Indian policy shifts with the times. We are currently in the policy period of tribal self-determination. Generally, tribal self-determination refers to the social movements, legislation, and beliefs by which tribes exercise self-governance and decision-making on issues that affect their own people. Tribal self-determination as a policy took hold in the 1960s with increased activism for civil rights. The shift in policy did not come easy. After 200 years of genocide and forced assimilation, tribal leaders waged war, not in the battlefields, but in the halls of Congress and in government of offices and the courts of public opinion. Public protests created publicity for their cause, such as the occupation of Alcatraz and Mount Rushmore, the Wounded Knee Incident, and other examples of American Indians uniting to change their relationship with the United States government. Independent newspapers promoted educational independence, working to reclaim lands and enforce treaty rights. The result was a Native American force which fought for change throughout a wide variety of interconnected social spheres. President Nixon addressed the issue in his July 8th congressional message, Recommendations for Indian Policy. He discussed his goal of policy changes that supported self-determination. And here I'll quote, it is long past time that the Indian policies of the federal government began to recognize and build upon the capacities and insights of the Indian people, both as a matter of justice and as a matter of enlightened social policy. We must begin to act on the basis of what the Indians themselves have long been telling us. The time has come to break decisively with the past and to create conditions for a new era in which the Indian future is determined by Indian acts and Indian decisions." End quote. The shift in federal policy had huge consequences and was the beginning of Native America as a political force, a not so subtle shift that meant American Indians and Alaska Natives were no longer bound by the limits of being conquered people. Tribes were recognized as governments, adding to the accepted paradigm of the city, county, and state as self-governing local units. Given the extent of colonial bias and narrative fiction that underlies so much of our Western legal discourse on federal law about Indians, 
Is it possible to decolonize the field? Yes. Yes, to the extent that we know that policies change. And we have a hand in forcing these policies, those policies to change. I use my lawyering skills to force such change. When I first started practicing law nearly 30 years ago, the state of Alaska and the Alaska Supreme Court did not believe tribes as political entities existed in Alaska. Now it is a foregone conclusion that they do. And yes, it is possible to decolonize the field to the extent that we can engage in the process of deconstructing, deconstructing colonial ideologies of the superiority and privilege of Western thought and approaches. As you know, decolonization involves dismantling structures that perpetuate power and privilege and addressing unbalanced power dynamics. Decolonization also requires valuing and revitalizing the indigenous worldview, which includes indigenous knowledge, culture, and spirituality. So last week, I live streamed a tribal governance symposium that took place at the University of Alaska in Fairbanks. The forum was organized to build understanding, relationships, and knowledge to advance tribal self-governance. The first panel was on Alaska Native wellness and spirituality. Panel speakers included individuals from different tribal affiliations and regions throughout Alaska, including Clinkett, Denina Athabaskan, Yupik, and Inupiaq. Despite their cultural differences, each speaker shared in common an indigenous worldview that consisted of a paradigm grounded in spirituality. Each agreed that spirituality is at the core of indigenous well-being. It is at the core of indigenous understanding of relationships. Oscar Cowgley, in his amazing book, a Yupik worldview, a pathway to ecology and spirit, elaborates on this and writes that the Native people, Alaska Native peoples, have traditionally tied, have traditionally tried to live in harmony with the world around them. This has required construction of an intricate subsistence-based worldview, a complex way of life with specific cultural mandates regarding the ways in which the human being is to relate to other human relatives and the natural and the spiritual worlds. This worldview, as demonstrated historically by Alaska Native people, contained a highly developed social consciousness and sense of responsibility. Kawikale points out that Native peoples, myths, Rituals and ceremonies were consistent with their relationships to one another and to their environment. Anthropologist Anne Finep Riordan has called the Alaska Native and other indigenous peoples the original ecologists. She states, indigenous peoples were able to sustain their traditional subsistence economy because they possessed appropriate ecological knowledge and suitable methods to exploit resources, but possessed a philosophy and environmental ethic to keep exploitive abilities in check and establish ground rules for relationships between humans and animals. Native people's reciprocity with the natural and spiritual realms implies a form of cross-species interaction and dependence that is now being recognized by Western science. In his book, Quigley notes this recognition in quotes by Caduto and Bruchak, who write, and I quote, the science of ecology 
is the study of the interactions between living things and their environments. And that circles back to the ancient wisdom found in the rich oil tradition, oral traditions of American Indian stories. Time and again, the stories have said that all of the living and non-living parts of the earth are one and that people are a part of that wholeness. Today, Western ecological science agrees. In fact, many climate activists are pushing for a cultural shift toward an ecological democracy as the only way to lay the foundations for sustainable prosperity and tackle climate change. As was mentioned this morning, young Greta Thunberg, the Swedish teen activist, climate activist, became the most recent to reiterate this theme when she visited Standing Rock recently. Beyond ecologists and climate activists, leaders of religious, spiritual, and environmental communities are also pushing for a cultural shift. On the occasion of the religious for the Earth Conference, on the occasion of their religions for the Earth Conference, ethicist Larry Rasmussen drafted a declaration that was adopted by faith leaders in 2016. In the declaration, faith leaders call for an awakened kinship with the earth. Excerpts of the declar declaration include an acknowledgement, and I quote, that because we have burned fossil fuels relentlessly for ravenous economies and exploding populations, Earth has entered a new geologic area, era which places us at a perilous moment. We are in the midst of monumental shift because nature has changed course. In the past, we have known ruin and rebirth, but we were always greeted by nature's reliability. Not so now. Our communities need a conversion to these tough truths of an altered planet. Climate change most harms those who contribute least to it. Yet urgency for social justice must find its way to creation justice. Learning from indigenous peoples, justice must and can include the moral claims of earth, air, fire, and water, the well-being of other species, and the needs of future generations. That comes from the Declaration of Faith Leaders, as they call for a cultural shift. I join these faith leaders in calling for a cultural shift. And as part of that cultural shift, we must value indigenous knowledge, culture, and spirituality, and deconstruct the Western myth. As I previously discussed, the doctrine of discovery is a false narrative that was used to justify, dominate, and eliminate indigenous peoples from their own lands. And as history illustrates, that false narrative of European discovery shrouded itself in religious Christendom, which sanctioned and encouraged conquest of non-Christians by the sword. White supremacy, patriarchal privilege and power, and the belief that indigenous peoples could and should be subjected to the laws of the conquerors became the dominant narrative. But that narrative is changing because fact is stronger than fiction. And fact tells a different narrative. And the facts are that despite colonial rule that sought to destroy, dehumanize, and debase indigenous peoples and other peoples of color over the course of 400 years, indigenous peoples were never fully conquered. We were never fully assimilated, and we did not stop fighting for human dignity and the right to be self-determining peoples. When they took indigenous lands, languages, dance, children, we were beaten down, but we were not conquered. When they told us we were inferior and in need of Western education, we were shamed, but we were not conquered. 
when they took our children and sent them to boarding school to learn the false narrative so that they too would teach their own children the false narrative. We mourned, but we were not conquered. When they told us to send our boys to church where they would be victim to pedophile priests, our trust was betrayed and our hearts bled, but we were not conquered. When our brothers and sisters, uncles and aunties took to alcohol and sometimes suicide, we grieved, but we were not conquered. When they raped the land to extract resources to feed the glut and greed of capitalist gain, we decried that desecration, but we were not conquered. When they glorified money over our salmon, our caribou, the animals that occupy the lands and waters, we cried out, but we were not conquered. When they polluted the water, the air, and our sacred spaces, we protested, but we were not conquered. And when they took our women and girls to be disappeared and murdered, our hearts despaired, and we said no more, but we were not conquered. We called upon our ancestors and took comfort in the knowledge that they were still with us, that we were not abandoned and we were not alone. The strength of the ancestors' prayers and vision helped us hold fast to the values, customs, and traditions of our peoples since time immemorial. And those values, customs, and traditions helped us survive. And much to the conqueror's surprise, not only did we survive, but we thrived. A well-known scholar, Dr. Gerald Visnor, has termed this phenomena survivance. And as Dr. Visnor has explained, survivance is more than mere survival. It is a way of life that nourishes indigenous ways of knowing. It is our indigenous way of life and ways of knowing that has helped us heal. I heard that today at a breakout. It is our indigenous way of life and ways of knowing that has helped us reclaim our heritage. It is our indigenous way of life and ways of knowing that has helped us give life back to our languages, our stories, our songs, and our art. It is our indigenous way of life and ways of knowing that has instilled hope in our elders and pride in our young people. It is our indigenous way of life passed on from generation to generation that has taught us that the knowledge and wisdom of our ancestors was gained from millennia of experience and relationship with the natural world. It is a knowledge and wisdom that teaches that we are connected to the natural world, that the natural world and all of its life forms are full of spirit and thus are sacred. And it is the sacredness of the natural world that calls on us to be protectors, to love and care for it. We know that when we harm the natural world, we harm ourselves. When we pollute waters with toxins and plastics, we poison ourselves. When we despoil the air and the land, we become sick. Today, as mankind is faced with an accounting and the terrible consequences of carbon emissions from the use of fossil fuels, as we are forced to grapple with the certainty of climate change, Westerners are beginning to recognize that indigenous ways of knowing are what may in fact save the planet. This is a changing narrative. The changing narrative is that knowledge and wisdom that indigenous peoples have gained from a millennia of experience and relationship with the natural world gives hope to the rest of humanity. It is the indigenous understanding of the natural world that can be used to restore balance and transition, and transition to a more just and sustainable future. Thank you. So 
I very well may have filled my 50 minutes, so I take it that we're going to skip question and answer and move right on. Thank you again. And Sheesh Heather for presenting today. Let's give Heather one more round of applause. This year we have a new addition to the symposium. We're hosting an exhibit hall where multiple groups will be participating, including Planned Parenthood, Persisters, Aware, Generation Action, Juno Suicide Prevention Coalition, and several other organizations. This will be an opportunity to find out about local resources that can be found in Juno. It will be located below Spice Cafe at the foot of the stairs. There will also be an interactive activity that attendees can participate. So you guys have probably already seen the tables. They're at the foot of the stairs just across the hall right here. In a moment, we'll be transitioning to our afternoon sessions. Just prior to that, however, I'd like to give a big shout out to all the sponsors and big supporters. The Power and Privilege Symposium is, a, is sponsored by Student Activities, the STEPS Grant, First Year Experience Program, and UAS Student Government. Let's give them all a round of applause. This event is very complex and of course requires the support of many individuals on campus. We'd like to give a special thank you to the UAS Faculty Senate, Pro Host Karen Carey, Jamie, and of course all our, our many volunteers who are working today. Shout out to the Ally students as well. After the last breakout session ends, several of the presenters will be hosting tables to answer any lingering questions regarding their, pres their presentations or to foster discussion time. There will, be a there will be a fellowship safe table where participants are not obligated to interact with presenters. Finally, thank you so much to each and every one of you for being involved in this symposium as a participant.